Well, for the sake of entertainment, I decided to stitch in some footage of a stunt video that my friends and I made back in high school. Here you'll see me hanging on top of my good friend's 1979 Chevy Vega while taking a pretty sharp turn. And believe it or not, we actually did this stunt three times before we got the car's rim to go rolling off screen. Enjoy. So here we are on my second special topics lecture designed to help students prepare for standardized exams. Today we'll be talking about IR and UV vis spectroscopy and mass spectrometry. After this lecture, you should be able to do the following. Explain how IR works and what it's for. Know where specific functional groups appear on an IR spectrum. Interpret and use critical IR spectral peaks to deduce molecule structures. Know what UV vis spectroscopy is used for. Know how mass spec works and what it's used for. And be able to interpret and use critical MS peaks to deduce molecules structures. IR spectroscopy is one tool that helps us determine compound structures. It works because all bonds wiggle in different ways when you shoot IR light at them. You can see that if I take molecules that look like this, I fire energy in the form of light at them, specifically infrared light. And they begin to move. Now, As these bonds wiggle, uh, they do it because they're absorbing energy from the light. Now the infrared energy that's left over, that is the energy that doesn't get absorbed, passes through the molecule and is detected and converted into something called an IR spectrum. The dangling peaks in an IR spectrum appear at places that are different and unique for each kind of bond. I now want to reacquaint you with a few physics equations that you might remember vaguely in some distant, semi-hungover way from one of your past classes, unless you took one of those fictional memory pills from the movie Limitless starring Bradley Cooper. Here's the first equation. Energy equals hc divided by lambda. Lambda, you'll remember, is a uh, wavelength. Now this uh, is supposed to actually be a symbol called uh, nu with a little line over it. This symbol represents wave number. Wave number is inversely related to wavelength. Thus we can say, because energy is proportional or inversely proportional to wavelength, that energy is directly proportional to wave number. Why in the world do I care about this? Well, if you actually look at an IR spectrum, you'll notice that the scale here at the bottom is written in wave numbers. The units are inverse centimeters. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it actually means that the higher the wave number, the higher energy will be the bond movement that it causes. Now, this meaning of this statement will become clearer as we move forward. Now, here are the IR peaks that I typically require my second year organic chemistry students to memorize. First, if your compound has a carbon-oxygen double bond in it, which is called a carbonyl, then you will say a big, and I mean big, pointy peak coming down around 1700 plus or minus 50 in your IR spectrum. If your compound has an OH in it, then you'll see a large, I mean it, a large broad trough somewhere between 3000 and 3600. And if your compound has a CH in it, which all organic compounds will, then you'll see big pointy peaks coming straight down around 3000. Now because IR spectroscopy tells you what kinds of bonds are found in your molecule, IR spectroscopy is most often used to determine a molecule's functional groups. I'm begging you to remember that because that sentence is frequently placed in different formats into standardized exam questions. Now here's the IR spectrum for cyclohexanol, which is shown here. The question we should ask is, does this molecule contain any of the functional groups seen in the previous slide? Why, yes it does. It has an OH right here. So where does that OH appear? Well, you should see a broad, large trough between 3,000 and 3,600, just as I said earlier. These little spiky guys here are CH bonds that are originating from the carbon-hydrogen bonds in this molecule. I hope that makes sense. Here is the IR spectrum for cyclohexanone, which has this carbon-oxygen double bond, or carbonyl. Does it contain any of the functional groups from our earlier slide? Absolutely. It has a carbonyl. Where does that carbonyl show up? Right here. Remember I said it shows up about 1700 plus or minus 50. 
and it's huge. Once again, these peaks right here correspond to the CH bonds in the molecule. What if you have a molecule that has both an OH and a carbonyl, as for this compound, which is called methyl glycolate? What would we see? Well, this is our IR spectrum. You'll notice that it has an OH in it, so we see a large trough right here in OH world, and it also has a carbonyl, which should appear right there. Now, one functional group that deserves attention is the carboxylic acid, which has both a carbonyl and an OH. However, in carboxylic acids, these two bonds are grouped together, or bonded together, instead of being separated, as in the example I showed on the previous slide. How does that make the IR appear? Well, here's the IR for cyclohexane carboxylic acid. As we look at this, we can easily see the carbonyl right here, 1700 plus or minus 50. No problem. Also, we should recognize these peaks right here are our CH peaks, right? But where is the OH? Do we see a big trough over here to the left of the CH peaks? We don't. But there's got to be an OH in there, right? Where in the heck is it? Well, you'll see that right here at the top, these peaks that belong to the CHs get broad at the top. You notice that? In the previous examples, they just come more or less straight down, but they get broad on the top. This broadness is indicative of an OH that's actually inside of those CHs. So because the OH stretch is energetically less demanding than an alcohol OH, the OH moves slightly to the right and ends up being piled on top of the CHs. In other words, if we could remove the CHs from the IR spectrum, we would see a beautiful broad OH trough showing up right here. So that is what a carboxylic acid IR looks like. You see broadness in the CH uh, peak. It's indicative of an OH that belongs to a carboxylic acid. Now, although I've shown you the only types of bonds that I typically harp on for my sophomore organic chemistry students, you should understand that IR spectroscopy can be used to see many more types of functional groups as well. Here are some taken from our class text. I honestly wish that I could say that you should never waste time memorizing all of these. However, the MCAT and other standardized exams will frequently ask questions that require one to know this information. And here are some others that I've shown other students that I've had in the past. If you have an NO2 in your molecule, you'll typically see vampire teeth showing up one between 15 1600 and the other between 13 1400. If you have a primary amine or an amide, if you have a carbonyl, you'll see two peaks between 32 and 3500. A secondary amine or amide has two or one peak that shows up 3200 to 3500, and a nitrile has a medium-sized sharp peak around 2200. I'll now show you examples of all of those different uh, molecules. So here is an IR containing a nitro-containing compound, nitrobenzene, right here. You can see there are two vampire teeth coming down, one around 1,600 and one around 1,400. See vampire teeth? That's indicative of an NO2. And here's an IR of an amine-containing compound, aniline, shown here. Because it's a primary amine, that is, it has two H's bonded to the nitrogen, it gives two peaks down here in this region. Now it should make sense to you that an NH stretch appears around the same place as an OH appears because an NH bond and an OH bond are chemically and physically similar. Here's an IR of a primary amide. This is called benzamide. Like its primary amine counterpart, it gives two peaks right down here uh, in the NH stretch region. And the most obvious addition, of course, is the presence of this carbonyl. Now one thing I should point out to you is it's really easy to remember that primary amines have two peaks down here, and primary amides as well, because there are two hydrogens on the nitrogen. Here's an IR of a secondary amine, which gives only one NH stretch down here. You see that? Okay, this compound obviously doesn't have any carbonyls. And what are these peaks right here? They're obviously uh, caused by the CH stretches present from these uh, alkyl chains here. Here's another secondary amine. Well, this is actually secondary amide. There's only one hydrogen stuck to this nitrogen, so we should expect to see one peak down here in the amide stretch, or the nitrogen-hydrogen bond stretch region, and we do. This compound obviously has a carbonyl, so in contrast to the compound shown on the previous slide, 
we see the carbonyl stretch right here, right around 1700 plus or minus 50. I hope that makes sense to you. Last functional group I want to show you is a nitrile. This compound is benzonitrile, C triple uh, N bond. Where does that show up? It shows up right here at 2200. This, incidentally, is one of the few things that shows up between 3000 and 1700 in the IR spectrum. Right there, about 2200, give or take a little bit on either side. So here are our IR standardized exam-like questions. First question, IR spectroscopy is most useful for distinguishing what? Next question, H2 doesn't give an IR spectrum because why? Next question, one mole of compound A absorbs two moles of H2 in a specific reaction. What reaction could that be? If you were running this reaction, which of the following IR data would indicate the reaction's completion? Next question, the IR spectrum of an organic compound has no strong absorptions from 1600 to 2600 or any above 3000. What functional group is it likely to contain? All right, we now move on to our next subject, that of mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry, or MS, is a technique that allows you to determine a compound's mass. For example, if your compound had a formula of C3H6O, then its mass would be 12 times 3, because carbons weigh 12, 1 times 6, because hydrogens weigh 1, and 16, because oxygen weighs 16. All added together gives you 58. So if you ran a sample of this compound on mass spectrometer, your machine would tell you that your compound's mass is 58. Now here's how mass spec works, more or less. We fire a compound down a column and blast it into a million pieces by bombarding it with electrons or sometimes other ions. The different pieces, which are now charged fragments, then travel down the column. The larger the fragment, the longer it takes to come out the end of the column. Thus, fragments are separated according to their mass-to-charge ratio, called m over z. The detector measures the fragments as they come out of the end of the column and calculates their individual masses based on the time it took them to travel the length of the column. This time is called their time of flight. Now you'll notice in this figure there's lots of crazy crap up here that I frankly don't care if you understand or learn. It just kind of shows you the different components in a mass spectral column. Now to show an illustrative real life example, let's pretend that we threw ethyl benzene into a mass spectrometer. It's possible that some of the molecules of ethyl benzene in our sample might get bombarded by a single electron to give this molecule, which would then come out of the column to give a molecular weight of 106.165. Because this molecule has the same molecular weight as the original structure from which it came, it's called the molecular ion, or sometimes also called the parent ion, or parent peak. In contrast, upon electron bombardment, some of the benzene or the ethyl benzene molecules might get dissected into these two fragments whose individual molecular weights are shown. Our mass spectrum would therefore give one peak at 77 and another peak at 25, in addition to the parent uh, ion peak of 106. It would be even more common for us to see our starting material get dissected into, uh, by electron bombardment into these two fragments. The reason for this is because this fragment right here is a benzyl radical, which is the most stable of all of the fragments shown on this slide, because this electron can be delocalized by resonance into the benzene ring. This radical would give us a mass peak at 91, while the fragmented methyl radical would give us a mass peak at 15. I hasten to point out to you students that a methyl radical is not as unstable as a methyl carbocation. Thus, in a mass spectrum of ethyl benzene, we would expect to see peaks for all of these ions, as well as probably many more. The most stable of this entire mixture, which once again I'm expecting, would be this benzyl radical fragment, uh, would give the tallest peak which is called the base peak. Remember, though, that the tallest peak does not necessarily correspond to the molecule's molecular mass, or M peak, also called the parent peak. The tallest peak, or base peak, only tells you which of all of the fragments produced in the column is the most stable and hence the most abundant. The abundances of all of the other peaks are calculated relative to the base peak.
Here's the mass spectrum for pentane, whose structure is shown here. The molecular ion peak M, which once again is also called the parent peak, is shown right here. It corresponds to 72, which is the molecular weight of pentane. Now you can see, though, that the M peak is not the tallest peak in this mass spectrum. The tallest peak, or base peak, is 43, which corresponds to a radical propane fragment, C3H7. So apparently when pentane gets chucked into the mass spec, the most stable fragment that comes out the other end is this propane fragment right here. So now I'll teach you about a tool called UV-Vis spectroscopy. Basically, you throw a compound into a UV-Vis spectrometer, where it's bombarded in sequence by UV and visible light. The compound will absorb some of that light and transmit the rest. The transmission is collected and compared electronically with the initial emission, and a spectrum is produced. The one thing that I want you to know is that UV-Vis spectroscopy is used most commonly to analyze conjugated double bonds. To remind you what that is, this is called accumulated diene. That's where both double bonds are on the same carbon. This type of compound is called an isolated diene, where both double bonds are at least one carbon away from each other, or maybe more. And these types of compounds are called conjugated dienes, where every other bond is a double bond. Double, single, double. Benzene is also a conjugated diene. You can see that right here. We've got double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, all the way around the ring. Now, of course, we know that benzene's aromatic, so all of these bonds have a partial double bond character in reality. Conjugated dienes are the ones that show strong UV-Vis spectra, and that's what UV-Vis is most commonly used for. And now we arrive at standardized exam type questions. This will be easy. UV spectroscopy is most useful for detecting what? Next question, in mass spectrometry, peak abundances are measured relative to what? And this question, which of these compounds would most likely show a base peak at mass over charge equals 43? And last question, mass spectrometry separates fragments according to what? Let's go to our next questions. A compound is analyzed by mass spectrometry. Its base peak at mz over z equals 81 comes out of the most stable fragment. Which of the following is that fragment? The next one, the key fragment m over z equals 45 corresponds to which of the following fragments? And last question, a compound is analyzed by mass spec. It gives no parent peak due to the instability of that peak, but does give a base peak at 55 and another one at 31. What functional group does this compound most likely contain? And that ends this first lecture on UV vis and mass spectrometry. We'll go on in our next lecture to talk about NMR spectroscopy. Until then, enjoy.